everybody. Um, welcome to our first Pollinators Week uh, webinars. Uh, tonight, we're going to be here with Dr. Brittany Kyle. My name is Laura Venner. I am the Global and Public Health Officer for SAVMA. Before we get started, please make sure that you stay muted for the duration of the webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat and my elect, Ashley Miller, and I will be fielding questions during and after the webinar. Um, just a few reminders before we get started. Um, the webinar will be recorded and we will be posting it to our SAVMA YouTube channel. Um, we will also be sharing the links with the SAVMA delegates. So do be on the lookout in the coming weeks for those links if you want to share it with any friends or um, if you missed a section. Um, also, please don't forget to take a photo or a screenshot of you in the webinar and tag yourself on the social media pages. Um, for a chance to win a $25 gift card for attending each one of the webinars uh, that we're hosting this week. So let's get started. Um, I'm really excited to introduce to you guys Dr. Brittany Kyle. Dr. Kyle uh, graduated from Ontario Veterinary College in 2009, and she began her career in a busy 24-hour small animal clinic in Toronto, Ontario. She worked as an associate for several years before leaving practice to focus on her young family. And during her time away, she began to study honeybees. She became president elect of the Honey Bee Veterinary Consortium and chair of the HBVC conference in 2019 and became the HBVC president in 2020. Dr. Kyle is passionate about educating veterinarians and the public alike about issues surrounding honeybees and other pollinators. In 2019, she established a pollinator garden at her local elementary school, where she works to engage children as well as the community at large in conservation efforts to protect pollinators. She enjoys lecturing to, veterinary, uh, to the veterinary community and writing about her experiences as a beekeeper and honeybee veterinarian. When she is not studying bees, Dr. Kyle is busy maintaining her small zoo of three boys, two cats, one dog, numerous fish, and a small handful of honeybee colonies. So please welcome Dr. Kyle. Dr. Kyle, I'm gonna pass it along to you. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I will apologize in advance as you will probably see some of my zoo passing through. <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully we keep the chaos to a minimum. But uh, first I just wanted to thank Laura and Ashley for inviting me um, to talk to all of you guys. And I'm super excited to get to kick off Pollinator Week with a topic that I find completely fascinating, and that's biology of the honeybee. And I'm gonna throw in um, a veterinary perspective here and there for some key messages that I wanna make sure you guys take home with you. So let's get started. The first thing I wanna address is this idea that when we say bee, do we mean honeybee? I find that happens all the time. And you can't just say bees and mean honeybees because in actuality, there's 20,000 different species of bees in the world. And some of them are um, generalists like our honeybee and they can use a wide range of floral resources. But other bees um, have co-evolved with one particular floral species and they have really cool and unique adaptations. And just in North America, we have about 4,500 species of bees that are native. <clears throat> this, um, these pictures here are just some pictures I took around my place of different um, bees that I could find. And it's really fun when you start to go out and look for bees. It's amazing the diversity that you'll see. The picture on the left, a lot of you will probably recognize this fuzzy little butt as a bumblebee. This one here, you can see the yellow, it's actually pollen that's coating her ventral abdomen. I believe she's a leaf cutter bee, maybe a mason bee. These little monkeys here, these are carpenter bees, and they love my back porch and um, the frame around my garage. And they drill these amazing, like perfect circles. It couldn't be more perfect if I used a drill bit. And they will tunnel inside and they'll put little offshoot tunnels where they lay their eggs. And they're really fun to watch, although I will say they like to nest above me. And often when I'm sitting on my back deck, I get rained on by sawdust. So a little bit of a, an annoyance at times, but definitely cool to watch. This little bee here, um, this was one hot sunny day when I was out playing with my kids in the yard. And this bee landed on me and then she went and she landed on my six-year-old for quite a while. And when a bee lands on you, you could think, oh my gosh, I was mistaken for a flower. 
but she's actually a sweat bee. So she's there because you're sweaty and gross and she's drinking your sweat. So pretty cool. They're very gentle. This tiny little bee, I don't actually know what species it is, um, but it was really small. I just know it's a bee because of some of the distinct anatomical characteristics. And then over here, we have a different species of bumblebee. So there's a variety of species of bumblebees. They're not all the same. And it's pretty cool to try to pick up the differences. And then the bee at the top is a green metallic sweat bee. And I put this one up here because I wanted to remind you that not every bee is a yellow and black um, stripey thing. And not every yellow and black stripey thing that flies is a bee. So a lot of times people will say, I got stung by a bee. They actually mean wasps or yellow jackets, but everybody lumps yellow black stripes together into bees. There's also lots of flies that like to dress up and look like bees, but they're, they're not actually bees. The one thing that bees do have in common is that their main protein source comes from pollen, which is from flowers, and that's what they feed their young. So honeybees, um, as the name implies, they specifically make honey, and there's nine different species of bees in the world that can do this. The majority of them are native to Asia. The one we're gonna talk about today is Apis mellifera. And Apis mellifera is commonly known as the Western or European honeybee. As her name implies, she's native to parts of Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, as opposed to Asia, where all of the other um, honeybee species are. But right now, if you look at the distribution of Apis mellifera on a map, she is at present almost worldwide, except for where it's super cold. She's not in the North or South Pole. And she's also not in really hot, dry deserts. But everywhere else in the world, we have Apis mellifera now. And that's because for most of the world, Apis mellifera is an agricultural species. And honeybees have been so important and integral to humans that we pretty much have records of them going back for as long as we have records of agriculture. In fact, there is pottery found from close to 9,000 years ago that had traces of beeswax on it. And we do know that some of our ancient civilizations um, kept honeybees as well. So it's really important and one of the key messages I want to get across is honeybees, Apis mellifera, is not native to North America. We did actually have a native honeybee here, but it went extinct millions of years ago. And then there was nothing um, making honey here in North America until Europeans started to bring Apis mellifera over with them. The earliest record I could find of that was 1622, but there have been multiple introductions of Apis mellifera over the centuries. So if Apis mellifera, or a honeybee, is an agricultural species, how valuable is it? If we were to take the agricultural species that you guys are all learning about, cattle, um, swine, small ruminants, poultry, and we compare them in terms of their impact on the global economy to honeybees, honeybees are actually number one. They are the most important agricultural species in the world when you look at the econ um, economics of it. In the US, the honeybee industry contributes about $20 billion every single year. So why do we like honey that much? I think a lot of us have a sweet tooth, but that's a whole lot of honey you'd have to sell. So the US has um, 2.7 million honeybee colonies, and this is continental US. And those honeybee colonies make about 150 million pounds of honey every year. If you look at the value of honey and you add in um, what uh, the impact to the economy is from the jobs surrounding the production of honey, it adds about a billion dollars. So that's impressive, but it's nowhere near 20 billion. So the real value is actually in pollination. So we can go back to math and we can actually calculate the value of pollination with a simple mathematical formula of V times D times P, where V is the value of the crop that we're looking at, D is how dependent that crop is on insect pollination, and P is the proportion of the insects pollinating that crop that are honeybees. So for example, almonds are completely reliant on honeybee pollination in order to produce almonds. So we can take the value of the honey crop and it would be multiplied by basically a factor of one for D and a factor of one for P because honeybees are really the only ones that are pollinating it. Conversely, if you look at a crop like wheat, it's wind pollinated. And so it may have a high value, but its D and P values would be pretty much close to zero. So it wouldn't add a lot to the calculation. But that um, calculation, V times D times P, is actually where we get most of that $20 billion um, from. There is also another value that we can't easily add, 
And that's the biodiversity that honeybees provide us in our ecosystems. A lot of you, when you think of honeybees out on flowers, you might picture them on dandelions or clovers or flowers in your garden, but they do so much more. A lot of our native um, trees, like our maple trees, our linden trees, um, willow trees, they're all pollinated by honeybees. And it is true that we have a large number of native bees here, but because there's so many problems that are facing the insect world right now, we don't have enough um, population of our native bees to be able to fully support our ecosystems anymore. And so honeybees, because they're so good at being generalist pollinators, can help to fill that role. So we're going to take a break from um, veterinary medicine for a minute and we're going to stop, step into botany to talk about what is pollination because it's obviously super important. So um, some of you may have learned this in um, undergrad in your biology courses, but flowers have stamens um, and you can see the stamens on the outside of the flower here. And the stamens contain anthers which have the pollen grains and then they, and on this flower you can see um, they're on these pink stalks which are the filaments and then the anthers are this white color here. They also have pistils, which include um, the stigma, which you can see here and here. And when a pollen grain is transferred from one um, anther on one flower to the stigma on a different flower, if they're of the same species, then you can get uh, fertilization of the seed. So, when bees fly, bees are actually furry little animals and they will pick up a static charge on their hairs. And when they land on the flower, the pollen actually has the opposite charge. So their whole bodies will be covered in pollen. They can then fly to another flower and transfer some of that pollen to the next flower. This picture down here um, is uh, an apple tree that was in my front yard. And I took the picture just to show you guys the effects of pollination. So this here was a flower and there are petals coming off up here and you can see that uh, the ovary which is where the seed is is starting to develop it's going to eventually in a few months become a delicious apple and it's developing because this flower was pollinated and similarly this one is also developing so it was pollinated but if you look back here you can see there is a flower or what used to be a flower it's drying up and the ovary part is not developing and that's because this did not um, get pollinated so it's eventually dried up and fallen off. So pollination is super important in our agricultural systems. And we know that pollination can improve not only the quantity of the crop, but it can also improve the quality of the crop. So I just wanna pause for a moment and really harp on this issue of pollination. It's so important to understand. And the reason why it's so important is it is the main driving force behind the honeybee industry in North America, especially in the United States. Because it's so valuable, a lot of commercial beekeepers in the US and partially in Canada as well, although to a slightly lesser extent, are migratory. So beekeepers will take their hives and they will load them onto skids and then they will use forklifts to put these skids onto flatbed trucks and they will drive across the country basically chasing flowers in bloom. They will go to anywhere where there's crops that are in need of pollination services. This is most evident if you look at almond pollination. So as I mentioned, almonds are completely reliant on honeybee pollination. The U.S. is the number one producer of almonds in the world. I think the U.S. grows about 90% of the world's almonds and all of the almonds in the U.S. are grown in one particular area in California. There isn't enough in that area to support the massive amount of honeybees that are needed to carry out um, pollination every year. So in February, just as the almonds are about to blossom, about three quarters of all of the beekeeping colonies in the continental United States go to California at the same time. They don't then go back home. A lot of times what they'll do is they'll go and visit other states where there's other crops in need of pollination services. So things like apples, cherries, pumpkins, cucumbers, broccoli, they all need our bees and particularly honeybees um, in order to be pollinated. I want you guys to understand this because it presents some really unique disease transmission risks. When else do we take the majority of our animals across our country and put them into one area at one time where they can all intermingle with one another? This is a challenge that um, 
that has to be addressed. And I don't have the answers, but maybe you guys will one day. There's also transportation stress. So moving the bees across country is not without risk to the health of the colony. Not only do we have to look at colony health, but there is also potentially welfare concerns with doing this. And we do right now don't have a really strong scientific foundation that can help us assess honeybee welfare. Also, as a veterinarian, how are you going to treat your patient if it's spending a significant amount of its time every year out of your state? You may not be licensed where your honeybees are spending most of their time. So it's a unique challenge. And again, I'm sorry, I don't have the answers, but I want you guys to think about it. All right, so we'll talk about anatomy. And I could spend this entire lecture just talking about anatomy because you might have guessed, but they're slightly different than the other animals that you guys are learning about. I can't go into that much detail in the, only the hour I'm given and throw in everything else that I want to. So I'm gonna give you guys the highlight reel, the big things that I think um, jump out at me as substantial differences between our honeybees and our mammalian species. So honeybees are insects and they don't have a skeletal system like our mammals do. Instead, they're covered in this hard, crunchy outer layer called an exoskeleton. And as I mentioned, honeybees are our furry little critters like our cats and dogs. And you can see this bee down here, how she's covered in all these fine little hairs. Their bodies are divided into three parts, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. So that's not that different. They do have two large compound eyes that you can easily see, but they also have three ocelli, which are simple eyes. So they have five eyes in total. And they have three pairs of legs instead of the two pairs of legs we're normal, uh, we normally deal with. And their legs have some cool adaptations on them. So their antenna are important um, to gather sensory information with. And when they're out flying, their antenna can get covered in dirt and debris. And um, oftentimes it's covered in pollen, of course. And it's really fun to watch them. But when they come back to their hive, they'll often land on the front and they'll give their antenna a little swipe with their front legs. And the front legs have a special notch that just runs around the antenna and cleans it off before they go inside the hive. On their back legs, they have an adaptation called the pollen basket. So when they land on that flower and they get covered in pollen, they'll take some time to groom themselves and they will groom most of the pollen um, and pack it into their pollen basket. And that allows them to carry the pollen back to their hive. They have two pairs of wings. So when they're folded down um, as they are in this picture, it's hard to see the two pairs, but they do have a forewing and a hind wing. And when they're flying, they can actually hook those wings together um, with little hooks that act like Velcro and it creates um, the wing can become like one unit. So it's a really efficient system. For mouth parts, they have two different mouth parts. They have a proboscis, which is a straw like structure that sucks up liquids. And on this picture here, it's some honeycomb that ripped open and there's honey inside these cells. And so they are all gathered around and you can see their little proboscises are out and they're sucking up the honey. They also have mandibles. Um, which you can see in this picture here. And the mandibles are um, their biting mouth parts. And I have actually been bitten by a honeybee. I wouldn't say it hurts. It's a strange feeling though. And of course, you guys probably have all um, been aware that honeybees do have stingers. Going internally, again, this is just highlighting some key differences. They do have a muscular system and they're inside of their thorax, they have flight muscles. And it's actually the contraction and expansion of the flight muscles that allow their wings to move up and down. They're not necessarily beating their wings, but they're using their muscles to do it. This is very efficient. And that's why such a tiny little animal can fly such a large, um, such a long distance. They do have a circulatory system and they have um, a dorsal aorta and a heart. Um, it moves hemolymph around and hemolymph is somewhat analogous to mammalian blood. For their digestive system, they have something called a honey crop. When they're out um, flying about, they will collect some liquids, mainly nectar and water, and they will put it into their honey crop, and then they can carry that back into their hive, where they can then regurgitate the contents of their crop. This is my kids' favorite fact. Um, honeybees have an expansive rectum, and that's because honeybees will not defecate inside their hive. They want to keep that hive as clean as possible, so they have to go on flights in order to relieve themselves. Well, 
here in Ontario, it gets mighty cold and no honeybee is flying in the winter months. So they basically have to hold it that entire time. So the rectum has to be able to expand until a warm sunny day finally arrives, in which case you see a mass exodus of bees running out to go to the washroom. They have a respiratory system, but it's not like our respiratory system. So they have 10 pairs of spiracles and spiracles are little openings that allow for the passive diffusion of gases. And these spiracles are connected to trachea and to air sacs. And they can actually pump the air sacs like bellows when they're flying so that they also have active gas exchange. They have something called a fat body and the fat body is somewhat analogous to a mammalian liver as well as mammalian adipose tissue. It's a really important organ for us to understand. One, it allows bees to be able to survive over the winter. The winter bees have really well-developed fat bodies. And two, if you are going to be learning about honeybees, you will definitely learn about a parasite called the Varroa mite. It's responsible for most of the honeybee deaths right now. And the Varroa mite is what is feeding on the fat body. So it's really important that we understand the role of the fat body and the impact of that parasite. And then glands, they have so many really cool glands. So honeybees have glands inside their head that can um, produce the food that they're gonna feed to the young. They have wax glands along their ventral abdomen and you can actually see large flakes of wax coming off of their wax glands. And they use these flakes of wax to build their honeycomb with. The venom gland. So a lot of you have probably heard two things about bee stings. One, a honeybee will die if she stings you. And two, you have to get the stinger off right away. So both of those are true. And the reason is because the worker honeybee has a barbed stinger. So when she sticks the stinger inside your skin, it stays stuck and she will then move away. As she moves away, the venom gland will rip out of her body and stay attached to the stinger. She will also often eviscerate herself while doing this. Even if she's not eviscerated, she will now have a large hole inside of her abdomen that's not compatible with life. So she is going to die. But she does, this happens because with the venom gland attached to the stinger, it can continue to punch venom into her victim. That's why you need to get it off right away. You don't want to reach down and, and squeeze it to get it off because you will then inject more venom into you. Um, but using a flat dull surface to scrape it away, it's not so much the stinger you're after, but you want to get that venom gland off as quickly as possible. And I actually just got a bee sting on the bottom of my foot a few days ago. And I can tell you it doesn't feel very good. And I got the, I got the gland, venom gland off within seconds. And it, it still is, it smarts. And then the other type of glands that I want to highlight are glands that produce pheromones. Pheromones are extremely important in a honeybee colony. And I want you guys to imagine yourselves as honeybees for a second. You live inside of a dark wooden box. When you're in there, it's pitch black. So you cannot rely on visual communication at all. There is some communication through vibration and movement. Um, a lot of you may have heard of waggle dances, but a lot of their communication occurs through pheromones. And so this picture up here on the top, um, over here and here, um, you can see these bees are pointing their butts up in the air and they're fanning their wings. And that's because they're releasing a pheromone called the Nazanoff pheromone. And I say it acts like a homing device. It basically gives their colony their unique scent. And so when they release their Nazanoff gland, any of their um, nest mates that are out foraging will know exactly where the colony is. It's kind of like calling them home. It's really, I think it's really cute to watch. So the life cycle of a honeybee has four distinct stages, the egg, the larva, the pupa, and the adult. So the egg, um, you can see in this top picture, they look like little grains of rice, and there is normally one in the center of each hexagonal cell in the honeycomb that the bees have built out of the wax. The egg, um, after three days, will hatch into a larva. And if you look on this picture, you can see these little white C-shaped things inside the hexagonal cells. Those are young larvae, and the goop that they're swimming in is the food that's being fed to them by the um, nurse bees. As they get older, they become much easier to see. So these are older larvae over here, and they become these pearly white glistening fat worm-like things that have a C-shape inside of the cell. At the end of the larval stage, the worker bees will come and they will put a wax capping on top of each individual cell. 
And then the larva will spin a cocoon and she, will she or he will pupate inside that cocoon. Over here, we have pictures of the pupal phase. This one here is just sort of stretching out. Um, it's at the very beginning, but then here you can see that the, the pupa is starting to take on the shape of the adult body with its head, um, its thorax, and its abdomen. And then this is looking at the pupa from the ventral aspect, so its legs are looking towards you. One of the last things that happens is they will take on the adult coloration to their body, so they're pearly white for most of um, the pupal phase. And then when they are full-fledged adults, the bees will chew through that wax capping and they will emerge as adults. You will hear the term brood and brood basically refers to any part of the life cycle that's not an adult. So it's the egg, the larva, and the pupa. And the brood can be opened or uncapped um, as these larvae are here, or it can be capped, otherwise known as closed when it's covered by those individual wax cappings. And there's a very typical pattern to the brood nest. So the queen who lays the eggs, she'll start in the center of a frame and she will move concentrically outwards. The effect of that is that your oldest brood is going to be in the middle and that's going to be capped first. Outside of the capped brood, you will have your uncapped brood and it'll be your oldest larva getting smaller and then your eggs. Beside the eggs, there's usually a band of pollen which is stored as bee bread and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And there's also usually on the very edge, there's some honey um, stores as well. The pollen is there because it's the protein source that the workers will use to feed to the developing larva. And the honey is there because it is the carbohydrate or energy source that's going to fuel all of those workers to do the jobs they need to do. So some terminology, if you guys are either going to venture into keeping bees or even if you're um, just working with clients that keep bees, there's some pretty particular terminology to get to know. The first thing I want to point out is you will often hear people say hive and colony interchangeably, but they are in fact two distinct things. The hive refers to the physical structure that the bees live inside and the colony is the group of the, um, the actual bees themselves. The most common design um, for hives is called the Langstroth hive and that's what I have here. This is one of, of my colonies and it's just named after the person who designed it. It's basically a series of wooden boxes stacked one on top of another and when you look inside the box there's individual frames. There's usually nine or ten per box um, and then the frames have oftentimes a sheet of foundation. The foundation can be either plastic or wax, and it is shaped, um, it is, sorry, stamped with the hexagonal cells, and it acts as a building template for the bees to then build their honeycomb on top of. The bottom boxes are where the brood is going to be raised, and so that's known as the brood nest. And then boxes on top of that are called supers. And it's pretty simple. They're called supers because they are superimposed on top of the brood nest. But in the supers is where excess honey will be stored. And that excess honey um, is where beekeepers will often remove those boxes in order to collect their honey crop. The very top box will be covered with an inner cover and then there's a lid that fits over the top to keep out the elements. And then all of these boxes will sit on top of a bottom board it's a little platform that holds them up. And there's a gap usually between um, the bottom board and the first box, which creates a big entrance that the bees can come and go. And you can make that entrance smaller with a reducer. And I also like to have entrances into the brood um, boxes as well. So there's lots of bees that can come and go at any time. There are other designs for hives that you will see on the market. But the one key thing that they all must have is that the frames need to be removable. This is actually a legal requirement a lot of times, but it's super important because being able to take out that frame means that we can inspect for diseases. So equipment. The first thing we'll talk about is personal protective equipment. So these are my kids up here and they're getting ready um, in their bee seats to go out and look at some bees. It's really important because when you open a hive, there's about 50,000 stinging insects. And no matter how attached you are to them, they're, they're not your friend. They will always view you as an intruder into the hive. So it's a good idea to be protected. Bee suits 
um, and jackets are often white or light in color. The reason being is if you think about the normal predator for honeybees, it's mammals like bears and skunks and raccoons. It's a lot of dark furry um, critters. So a tip that I was told is um, don't dress like a bear when you're gonna work with bees. So you wanna wear uh, a light color. Even if you don't um, have a bee suit or jacket because I often don't, um, I do recommend that you wear a veil. So a veil is some kind of hat that fits on your head and then it, enclo it closes 360 degrees around your head with a mesh screen and you can see through it. It's important to wear a veil because honeybees actually have carbon dioxide sensors. So they know where um, that carbon dioxide is coming from is your mouth and your nose. They also seem to know that the dark circles near that carbon dioxide are your eyes and they will preferentially sting you there. The reason being is going back to the notion that their main predator is a bear. Stinging a bear on its backside isn't gonna do a whole lot of good, but getting a bear in its eye or around its muzzle is more likely to have some kind of an effect. So good idea to protect your face. I wanna do a quick note about beekeeping gloves. When you first go to buy some beekeeping equipment, people will wanna sell you gloves. As a new person working with bees, you probably wanna wear gloves because you wanna protect your delicate, sensitive hands. But I do not like them, I don't recommend them, I don't use them myself. And there's two main reasons. First of all, they're thick leather gloves, very similar to the gloves that we use to wrangle fractious cats. And so you have really poor dexterity in those gloves. So when you go to pick up a frame, you can easily crush bees without knowing it. One, I think it feels terrible anytime I kill a bee, so I don't wanna do that. But also when you crush a bee, she's going to release an alarm pheromone, and that alarm pheromone is going to tell everybody else in her colony that there's an intruder in the hive. You can't get rid of that pheromone easily either, so every time you go into a colony after that, they're going to be alerted to the fact that you're there. The other reason I don't like gloves, and you can see in this picture here, they get dirty really quickly. A lot of the products inside of a beehive, like wax and propolis and honey, it's sticky and it's really hard to clean off. It's also a perfect medium for transferring disease from a sick colony into a healthy colony. So I don't ever wear gloves. When I'm working my own um, hives, I just use my bare hands. I had to get used to the sensation of bees crawling on my fingers, but I can honestly say out of every sting I've had, I've never actually had a sting on my fingers or hands from picking up and moving frames. When I work with clients' bees, um, I would use nitrile gloves. And nitrile will be somewhat protective because the bees won't recognize it as something that is worth stinging. But also, and more importantly, you can take them off and change them, especially if you've been inside of a sick colony. So it's really important as veterinarians that we always keep that in mind. Lastly, it's important to have an EpiPen because again, you are dealing with so many stinging insects. You will inevitably be stung at some point and you could have been stung a hundred times by honeybees with no problem, but the 101st sting could cause a severe allergic reaction. So it's a good idea just to make sure you're prepared in case of an emergency. The hive tool. So that's this little tool down here. They look sort of like um, little crowbars. I call it the Swiss army knife of the beekeeping world because it is incredible how much it does and you simply cannot work a hive without these hive tools. Bees like to glue everything together inside of their colony and you need these little crowbars to pry everything apart. You can also take off um, beeswax because sometimes they'll put it where you do not want it. Um, you can open up the wax cappings on those um, frames of brood to look at what's going on inside because who doesn't want to peek under there? Um, so the hive tool is super important. This smoker, a lot of you have probably heard that beekeepers do use smokers, and that's true. Um, the best reason I heard for this, and I don't know if this is based on science, but it made a lot of sense to me, was when you give the bees a puff of smoke, they will actually go into their colony and they will start to consume honey, and they will fill up their tummies in preparation of having to take off in case of emergency if there is a fire. 
And so the idea is that it makes the bees a lot less aggressive because you guys, if you think about the last time you had a really big meal, you probably didn't want to start debating with somebody or arguing. You probably just wanted to go and lay on the sofa in the living room. Um, so that's the best reason I ever heard for, for using a smoker. Um, but it does seem to work and it is very effective to moving the bees out of your way. And then there's lots of other tools on the market. Um, there's an amazing amount of gadgets and gizmos that are being developed for, for bees and beekeepers. Okay, so let's actually talk about the actual bees inside the colony. There's three different types of bees. The first is the queen, and she's up here on the slide. Pretty easy to see because of this fancy white dot. They don't normally come like that. There's the drone, and the drone is down here. And then the workers are every other bee on this slide is a worker. So we'll talk about each one individually. The queen is a female and she's diploid. She is physically different from the other females in the hive, which are the workers. And you can see that her abdomen is elongated. And it's elongated because she's the reproductive female. So she has developed ovaries. So those take up a lot more space. For her to develop from an egg to an adult takes 16 days. And the worker bees will feed her royal jelly. And it used to be thought that there is a difference in the diet of what was fed to the queen bee versus what's fed to the workers. And something about that difference in diet would cause the phenotypic variation. But it turns out a recent study showed that it's actually the amount. So the queen bee gets fed a large amount of jelly compared to the other bees. And that's how she, something about that triggers her to develop into the queen. She is not going to develop inside the typical hexagonal cell, but instead she gets a special queen cup. So this is looking up into a queen cup. And then up here, this is actually a queen cell. It becomes known as a queen cell when there's a queen um, developing inside but it comes vertically off of the frame. And that's simply because her abdomen is so much longer that it needs that extra space to develop in. The queen can typically live for two to five years, although we do find um, there's a lot of reports of queen failures. And so many beekeepers will actually replace their bees every single year, or sorry, their queen every single year. And if you go down south, I have heard, um, in places where there isn't a break in her egg laying because there's no winter, I've heard that some beekeepers will actually replace their queen every six months. There is only one queen per colony in general. There's always exceptions to the rule, but most of the time there should only be one queen in the colony. And when she emerges as an adult, she'll take a few days to get used to being an adult, and then she'll go on some short orientation flights where she'll learn where her colony is located in the world. After that, she's going to go on mating flights. When she goes on a mating flight, she will fly past this area where male bees are hanging out. It's called a drone congregation area. And when the, one of the drones spots a virgin queen fly by, they will chase after her like a comet of bees. The first male that catches up with her will evert his endophallus and he will mate with her in flight. After a few seconds, there'll be an audible pop and his endophallus will break off and he will fall to his death. The next male that catches up to her um, will remove the previous male's endophallus and then he will mate with her. And she will do this um, with up to 20 different males before she returns to her colony. And she will take all of the sperm from those um, matings and she'll store them inside of, inside of something called the spermatheca. She'll then return to her colony and there will be no need for her to ever leave her colony again. And she's an egg laying machine. So she can lay up to 2000 eggs per day and she can control fertilization of the egg. So as she walks along on an empty um, honeycomb, when she comes across an empty cell, she'll measure it with her front legs. And if it's a typical size, she'll decide that they need a worker. And so she will release an egg. And at the same time, she releases sperm from the spermatheca. The egg becomes fertilized. And then that fertilized egg can develop into another female bee. If, however, she comes to a cell that's a little bit larger when she measures it, she'll know that they need to have a drone or a male bee. So she will release an egg, but she will not release any sperm. And so she will lay an unfertilized egg. And it's the unfertilized egg that becomes the male bee. 
And she has a very um, unique pheromone to herself called the queen pheromone. And that's going to let all of the other bees in the colony know that she is there. On this picture here, um, this is one of my queens. And you can see she's got a blue dot on her this time. So the color of dot is used by beekeepers to mark the year that she's born. So you can very quickly know, and it's sort of a universal color coding system for, for queens. Um, you can very quickly know this, um, she was born this year, so she has a blue dot. And these are workers that are standing around her in a circle. And these are her attendants. So the workers will actually take care and do everything for her. The only thing she needs to do is lay eggs. The workers will feed her, they'll groom her, they'll clean up her poop if she defecates because she doesn't leave the hive. She's the only one who's allowed to defecate in the hive. So the worker bee is also a female and is also diploid because the worker came from a fertilized egg. From egg to adult is going to take 21 days, so a little bit longer than the queen. She's going to be fed worker jelly. The, um, the workers get fed royal jelly for a couple of days and then it switches into worker jelly, a slightly different composition. At peak population, there can be 50,000 workers in a colony. In the summer, they will live about six weeks, but in areas where we have the four distinct seasons, in the winter time, the workers need to be able to survive for up to six months. As the name implies, they do all of the work in the colony and their jobs actually progress chronologically with age. When they first emerge, they'll have jobs like being nurse bees, which is taking care of the larva, feeding them, and so forth. Some of them will be housekeepers, they will produce the wax and build the, the honeycomb um, and clean everything up. There'll be undertaker bees, which will take any sick or diseased um, bees, whether they're adults or pupa or larva, and kick them out of the hive. As they get a little bit older, some of the bees will be guard bees, where they will stand watch at the entrance, ready to attack any intruder into their hive. And then the very last job that a worker bee has is to be a forager. And it's the last job because it's the most dangerous since they have to leave the hive to do that work. There's a very popular belief that the queen bee is in charge, but in fact, it's really the workers that rule the colony. So foraging is pretty fascinating um, to learn about. Honeybees will actually go out to forage for four different things that they will bring back to their hive. The first is pollen. So this bee here, you can see this is pollen that's packed into her pollen baskets and she's just recently arrived back and she's searching for a place to put that pollen. Um, we affectionately refer to this as wearing pollen pants. But when she finds an empty cell, particularly an empty cell around the brood nest, she'll pack that pollen in and she'll mix it with some nectar and the pollen will actually ferment and it becomes this shelf stable product so they can store it over a long period of time and still have it be a good um, viable protein source for them. And you can see here that they actually have different colors. So this pollen was um, purple, this one here is red, this one's quite yellow, and that's just because the flowers have different colored pollens. And it's really good to see a large variety of pollens because they all have different complements of amino acids. Bees also will forage for nectar and they will bring it back, as I mentioned, in their honey crops and they will empty it into the cells of the honeycomb and turn it into honey. And we'll go into more detail about that in a minute. They'll forage for water because bees need to drink as well. And it's really fun. You can easily set up a pollinator water station where you just take a shallow dish and um, with some fresh water and I put rocks in it so that if they fall in, they can climb back out and they don't drown. Um, but it's a fun way that you can help our pollinators out. And then propolis. So bees will go out and they will collect tree resins and they will bring it back and it is this incredibly sticky substance that is like super glue. And they will coat any crack or crevice, any rough surface in their hive. They'll coat things that they don't like in their hive that they can't get rid of. They'll just cover it in propolis. And propolis is really important because it's antimicrobial. And so it actually plays a role in the immunity of the colony. So I just wanna take a moment and reflect on why understanding foraging behavior is important. And that's because it creates very unique biosecurity risks that we don't need to deal with in our other agricultural animals. We cannot control what the bees are eating and drinking. We can with every other animal that we raise for agricultural purposes and that we work with as veterinarians. 
but we have no say in where the bees are going to get their food and what water they're drinking from. We can't control where they go. So when honeybees forage, they'll typically go in a two kilometer radius um, from their colony, but they can go up to 10 kilometers away if there's a good foraging site for them. So that's a great large distance that they can cover. And we don't necessarily know everything that's going on in that radius. We also can't control who our bees are interacting with because when they're out on foraging sites, they could meet up with native bees, they could meet up with honeybees from other colonies. Sometimes they will accidentally drift or pop into a colony that's not their own. Sometimes they will actually go on purpose to another honeybee colony that isn't as strong as them. And they will go inside and rob that colony, taking their honey and their nectar and, and their protein pollen stores to take back to their own colony. So it creates really unique risks, but even though there's some um, unique challenges with working with bees, a lot of the fundamentals of biosecurity that are important for all of our other um, animal species are still applicable to our honeybees. So I said I would talk a little bit more about making honey. Um, I find this completely fascinating. So they'll collect nectar from flowers and nectar is about 70% water with sugars in it. In order to make one pound of honey, they actually need to collect nectar from two million flowers which is incredible if you stop to think about the fact that in the United States, we make 150 million pounds of honey every year. That is a mind blowing amount of flowers that need to be foraged from. They're gonna come back and they're gonna regurgitate it into the empty cells. So the next time you guys eat honey, I want you to remember that you're basically eating bee vomit. Um, but once it's in that cell, the workers will fan their wings over it to dry it off. And they will remove the moisture content from 70% all the way down to 17%. They do that again, similar to making bee bread. They want something that they can store that will stay viable and good for a long period of time. And with such a low moisture content, the honey can't really have um, bacteria or yeasts that can grow and multiply inside of it. Uh, it's just not compatible with life to be without so much water. Once um, they've made it into honey, they will cover it with wax. It's very similar to how we would put a lid onto a jar. So they're just sealing it and storing it for later use. They're storing it because they want to be prepared for times in the environment when there aren't for resources that they can go out. That's extremely obvious where I am coming um, come about end of October until about February. There's nothing blooming. Um, I don't even want to be outside. So there's no resources for them to collect and they need to have good stores. But even in areas that are hot and dry, there may not be enough floral resources um, at certain times of the year when it's too dry for plants to be producing um, flowers and nectar. So this is, um, they need honey no matter where they live. In her entire lifetime, one single forager will produce about a 12th of a teaspoon of honey. So the next time you guys are eating honey, don't just remember that you're eating bee vomit, but also just stop and think about how many bees went into making that honey that you're now eating. It's rather incredible. And to make one pound, it actually takes 556 honeybees working together to gather enough um, nectar. They do this, they basically will work themselves to death gathering this resource, not because one honeybee can make enough honey to support her colony, but because it is the collective um, working together that allows their colony to survive year after year. The last type of honeybee in a colony is a drone. And he's a male and he's haploid because he came from that unfertilized cell. He is um, physically different because he has very large eyes compared to the workers because he needs to be able to spot a virgin queen in flight and he has large, well-developed thoracic muscles because he needs to be able to catch up to that queen. We call them the football players of the hive. They don't have stingers. Their stingers develop into their endophallus, so they are not able to sting you. It's really handy. My three-year-old loves to come out to the bee yard with me to work bees, and he always wants to cuddle the bees. But over time, I'm convincing him that the only bees he is allowed to gently cuddle are the males because they can't sting him. 
from egg to adults takes 24 days. So that's longer than our worker, which was 21 days, and significantly longer than our queen at 16 days. And similar to workers, he's going to be fed his own type of jelly called drone jelly. And he doesn't develop inside the typical um, cell. His cell will be slightly larger, and it will actually um, come, come out of the frame a little bit more. It's more bullet-shaped, basically just because he's larger. His only purpose in life is to find that queen to mate with her. If he's successful, um, as I said, he will die. One thing I want to mention with hanging out in these drone congregation areas that I think is pretty cool is the drones will fly a particular distance from their colony and they will meet up with drones from other colonies and they will hang out together. But the queen, when she goes on her mating flight, she will actually fly a different distance than the drones do. And that way there is no um, breeding between uh, the queen and the drones from her own colony. So he dies if he's successful in his life's quest. However, it's not so happy to be a drone because at the end of summer, if he hasn't made it, the workers will actually just kick him out of the hive because he's going to be a drain on resources. One thing that's really important to understand um, when working with bees is that they form a superorganism. So what that means is that they're social insects and they have very defined tasks and jobs that they need to carry out. And you need to have all of the types of bees present inside of a colony um, for that colony to be able to survive and reproduce. You cannot have a healthy um, colony of bees that's made up of only workers and drones. You can't have a healthy colony that's made only of queens and drones or drones and workers. You need all three types of bees to survive. And so it brings up a really interesting question of what is the animal? Is it the individual bee or is it the colony? And I think in veterinary medicine, we need to look at the colony as the animal. The individual bees are more like the cells that make up the animal. Also, it's important to know that the sum of the total is greater than just the individual parts. The reason why I put this picture up here, first of all, I love that bees do this, but when you move apart a frame of bees, they will grab onto each other and chain together like no bee can be left behind. But I put it up as a reminder that the bees are all working together. And you can't just look at the health of your queen, the health of your worker, and the health of your drone and decide if you have a healthy colony. You need to assess how the roles are being carried out, how they're working together, how they're communicating in order to actually have a healthy animal. Because the colony is a superorganism, it actually has its own life cycle. And so in areas where um, there's just the four distinct seasons, there's a seasonality to beekeeping. In spring, coming out of winter, they're going to have about 10 to 15,000 um, uh, worker bees, and they need to build up the population really rapidly because they want to have as many bees available to be gathering resources when there are resources out in the environment. So they're just focused on building up population in the spring. And then in summer, they'll be at their peak population around 50,000 workers, and they will just be focused on getting as many resources as they possibly can. Come fall, they're going to be preparing for winter. The winter bees at the, will emerge at the end of summer or at the beginning of fall, and they're physically distinct from the summer bees because they need to be able to survive through that whole winter. So they can live for up to six months, as I mentioned. And then winter, I find this so fascinating, but what happens to bees when it gets really cold outside? So once it gets to about 10 degrees Celsius, which I believe is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, the bees are no longer um, able to get out to fly. So they will be confined in their hive. And as the temperature drops, they will start to huddle together in a cluster. They can actually get so close together that they can interlock their little hairs. And they will start to shiver their flight muscles to generate body heat. The bees on the outside form an insulating layer. And so if it's minus 20 outside, the center of that cluster of bees can be 30 degrees, um, roughly. The queen is gonna be in that center. So she's warm and she's happy and she has no problem surviving the winter. She doesn't know um, what cold temperatures really are. For the bees on the outside of that cluster, as they get cold though, they can switch places with bees uh, on the interior, the bees that are warm. And as they do this, they need to consume honey because that's going to be their energy source so that they can generate body heat. 
and they will actually move collectively as this little ball throughout their hive. They tend to move in an upwards direction and they'll consume their honey stores. And that's really why they make honey. It's not for our benefit. Another aspect of being a super organism is the fact that you can have reproduction on the colony level. So we talked about reproduction of the individuals where the, qu the queen meets with a drone and she lays eggs, but the colony also reproduces. This usually happens in the spring, but it's when they're starting to run out of space in their brood nest. It starts to get congested and they seem to come to this um, consensus that they need to divide themselves. So the workers will raise a new queen. In fact, they'll raise many queens, but the first one that emerges will go around and kill all the other queens, so she'll be the only survivor. And then once she's there, the old queen and half of the workers are going to leave, and this is called a swarm. That's what this is here. The swarm of bees will find a little temporary landing site to hang out. They're this big clump. The queen's going to be somewhere in the middle where she's well protected. And then scout bees are gonna to start to fly off looking for homes. They will come back and they will do a little waggle dance to communicate to the other bees in the swarm about how good the home they found was, what direction it was, how far it was. And when all of the scouts come back, they somehow compare their notes on what homes they found and they will make an agreement somehow. And then all of the bees will fly off together and go and find their new home. So one colony becomes two. And this was actually super exciting because this was actually only um, a little over a week ago that uh, a woman in my neighborhood called me and she said, hey, Brittany, there's like a bunch of bees in my backyard. Do you want them? And I was like, well, free bees. Who doesn't want that? So I biked over with a box and I was able to scoop all of these bees um, off of this uh, tree and into the box. And as long as the queen is there, the bees are going to stay with the queen and they're really not aggressive when they're in a swarm. I then biked the box home, a little bit interesting, but we made it home and I tipped them into a new hive. And I actually just went and checked on them yesterday and I found a beautiful looking queen and lots of eggs. So it seems that they have set up shop, but wherever they came from, there's an original colony, colony A, and now I have colony B. So one colony became two and they reproduced themselves. So you wanna be a bee vet. I put this picture, hopefully I didn't scare you off. <laughs> hopefully there's some interest there. But I put this picture up. So this is actually from my swarm hive that I found yesterday. And I put in a frame with foundation in it. Good, strong, solid foundation. And these little monkeys decided they didn't like it. And they're now building their wax comb where they want it. Always humorous to see, but it actually reminded me of what it's like to be a honeybee veterinarian. It's basically a choose your own adventure. Vet schools give you a really strong foundation, but right now there's not a lot of formal training on honeybee veterinary medicine. So you really have to advocate for yourself and choose your own um, path. One thing I would recommend is that you get to know your state or provincial apiary program and you learn what the legislation and regulations are because they are different state to state and province to province. Network with bee vets, and I have a suggestion how to do that on the next slide. Encourage your school to include honeybees. Go and talk to the people in charge of your curriculum hours. If you can't get curriculum hours, find crazy vets like me that love to talk about bees and have us for lunchtime talks. See if you can fed, um, set up field days. Maybe your state or provincial apiarist has an idea, or maybe your university has an entomology department or an extension office, and they might already have hives on campus and they might be able to have some veterinarians out to go and look at the hives and walk you through a hive inspection. It's a good idea if you're serious about this to join your local or state or provincial beekeeping association and learn the husbandry. You might have picked up from this talk that bees are a little bit different than most of the animals that you guys are studying and learning the husbandry is super important. There's a lot of intricacies to working with bees that are really hard to teach so I would definitely recommend taking beekeeping courses on husbandry. There's some really good ones online. Um, Penn State Extension has a great online beekeeping course. I've taken it. Um, you can also find beekeeping courses in your area. I did one that stretched over eight months, which was pretty awesome because every month we would go out and work the hives in the different seasons. So it was pretty cool. Try to find a mentor who's a beekeeper that can teach you some things. 
even better than just a mentor is finding a variety of different beekeepers that will mentor you. Because the one thing I have learned, there are so many different ways to approach beekeeping. And if you ask 10 beekeepers how they would deal with the situation, you'll probably get 11 answers. So getting a variety um, of sources of information together is really helpful. But it all comes down to also just getting bee miles. So spending time in hives will do a lot. You need to get comfortable working with these insects. And the more experience you have with handling them and working with them, the more prepared you will be to help your clients. Some resources. So a shameless plug, um, but the Honeybee Veterinary Consortium. So I'm the president, so I'm going to mention them. But we really want to attract our student membership. So our membership is only $10 a year. It allows you to network with other veterinarians that are studying honeybees. We do have a quarterly newsletter. We have an annual conference, which this year will be online. And it'll be September 21st, 22nd, 28th, and 29th. There, my advertisement is done. Um, we're also working on increasing our resources, though, for our membership. And we have forums where you can ask questions and so forth. So I definitely recommend you guys join. The Veterinary Information Network has um, honeybee courses every year. So far, they've been taught by Dr. Megan Milgrath from Michigan State University. She's an extensionist there. She's an amazing instructor. So um, it may be a good resource for you guys to check out. The USDA has a training module specific for honeybees. As a Canadian, I couldn't get credit for taking it because I don't have a U.S. license, but I could still go through the entire module and it was really great information. There are a number of textbooks on the market. A couple I'll highlight. This one here, Honeybee um, Diseases and Pests by the Canadian Association of Provincial Apiculturists. You can order it online. I think it's $10, um, but it's got lots of pictures and it's a really good quick resource. Honeybee Veterinary Medicine by Dr. Vernal. The Down Laquette is really well written and I find it just really pleasant to read. I'm super excited about this one, um, Honeybee Medicine for the Veterinary Practitioner, which is edited by Terry Ryan Kane, who will be speaking to you guys later this week, as well as Cynthia Ho. It's going to be a great book because it's written all by North American veterinarians or um, veter honeybee researchers. So it's specific to North America, whereas the other two textbooks um, are actually um, European based. Journals. There's bee-specific journals. The best one, um, most well-known one, is the American Bee Journal. There's also lots of scientific journals that include articles about honeybees. There is a massive amount of research going on regarding honeybees. A lot of them are open access, so you can easily spend hours going down the rabbit hole of honeybee research, and it's, I find it a really fun way to spend my time. And then feel free to contact me if you guys have questions. And with that, I'm finished. And if you guys have put questions into the chat, I'm happy to stick around and answer them. Well, thank That's you. A okay. lot of information. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Kyle. That was really, really informative. We definitely have a couple of questions if you still have some time to chat with us. Yeah. Um, well, so we, um, Ashley and I got some ones privately sent to us, but I want to also address the ones that were sent to us um, in the chat as well. So the first one I wanted to bring up was, um, is human consumption of honey harmful to the species in any way? So yes and no. So it depends on the beekeeper's practices. In general, no, it's not harmful to honeybees. As long as they're in an area with a lot of flowers and a lot of nectar, they will just keep on foraging and foraging and foraging, and they will produce massive amounts they will produce an excess of what they realistically need to get through the winter. So if, as long as you're harvesting appropriately and being mindful to leave enough honey behind that the colony can survive through the winter, then I think it's perfectly safe for the bees to be consuming their honey. Okay. Um, and how would you know how much is enough, that you're leaving enough for the bees to survive a winter, but you're taking yeah. what you need? Yeah, well, so there actually is recommendations based on your area and how cold your winters get and how long your winters are on how much honey needs to be in the boxes. And, and a lot of it times it's by weight. So you can actually weigh your hives. And so um, around here, it's, they say roughly 100 pounds um, of weight inside those brood chambers will be enough honey for them to get through. Um, that's sort of a general rule. And you can check that out for wherever you guys live. 
but there's also something that you can do in the winter. You can, if you have a thermal camera, and this is really cool, but you can actually go and look at the hive and you can see where that cluster is. Mm -hmm. And if they're down low, it means they still have lots of honey stores. If they're starting to get towards the top, especially um, as winter dwind dwindles down, they tend to be at the top. If they're all the way at the top, that means they're out of food. And if you don't intervene and feed them, then they will starve to death. So starvation is a real problem for honeybees. But again, you try to make sure you don't take too much honey. You try to make sure you give them time in the fall to take, get as much honey packed into their brood nest as possible. But then you can also monitor how they're doing in the winter. Even if you don't have a thermal camera, you can actually go out and open the top of the hive and peek in. And if you see all those faces staring back at you at the top, you know you need to feed them in order to help them get through winter. Okay, perfect. Um, so our next question is, um, I know in Ontario, the government suggests beekeepers prophylactically use antibiotics to treat colonies annually. Yeah. What are bee vets currently doing to minimize the use and abuse of antibiotics? Uh. Also, are there natural alternatives that vets could have approved to combat fungal diseases? All right. So this is a very emotional topic for me as a veterinarian in Ontario, um, because yes, here we do recommend that um, bees get treated twice a year with antibiotics, just protectively. There's a bacterial disease um, called American fowl brood. It's incredibly devastating. If it gets into a colony, that colony will die. So sometimes beekeepers will use the antibiotics in order to prevent it. However, they can suppress the disease um, and have it be there. Antibiotics also, as you guys know, when you give an antibiotic to an animal, it's not just targeting that one bacteria. That would be nice, but there are side effects as well. So a lot of beekeepers will prophylactically use antibiotics, but it's really important as veterinarians that we look at what is the evidence that supports this use? Is it warranted? Do we have enough prevalence of the disease in order to say we need to blanket protect every single colony? We don't necessarily have the answers yet. Um, this is something that as veterinarians, we need to work on and figure out. We need to be able to evaluate what appropriate and judicious use is. At the same time, you don't just want to say to a beekeeper that's been using antibiotics, okay, no, you're cut off. Um, because if you suddenly discontinue them, there's definitely a fear that these diseases can pop back up. So that's a big can of worm question. And I am happy to chat at nauseum um, with anybody that wants to, uh, to talk to me about it, but I'll kind of try to leave it at that. Um, <laughs> otherwise I'll go on for the rest of our time. That's always a great question, antibiotic use. Um, <laughs> are there any natural alternatives that vets could use to combat some of these fungal disorders? So there is a lot of research going on right now. For the longest time, we thought that honeybee nutrition was simply pollen and sugar, and that white table sugar was equal to all the other sugars. But it turns out there's a lot to honeybee nutrition we don't yet know, and they may be able to use some supplements, um, essential oils, algal, algal supplements, probiotics, um, and that may have a beneficial effect, but that's something that is currently being researched. So we still have a long way to go. There are definitely products out on the market that um, are, are claiming that they have a substantial impact on either improving colony health or decreasing disease risk. Um, but I would encourage you to definitely look at the science behind it and make sure that it's backed up with, with peer reviewed solid science. It's a work in progress. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned that some beekeepers will replace their queen bees every six months or every year. How does this work? Uh, do the rest of the bees readily accept the new queen bee or are there changes or are there changes within the colony when this happens? So sometimes they'll accept a new queen and sometimes they won't. So um, it, it sort of just depends. But you can crush your queen and get rid of her. And then sometimes they will actually recognize because her pheromone um, disappears, they will recognize they're queenless and then they will rush to take one of the eggs that she laid and turn that into a queen. 
So sometimes that happens, but more often than not, beekeepers are actually going out and purchasing queens that have certain traits that they may want to introduce into their colony, certain genetic traits. And you can introduce her slowly. So a lot of times she'll be inside of a little cage um, with some candy inside so she doesn't starve to death. And you can um, put that inside and the candy kind of blocks the, um, the door so she can't get out right away. And you can put her inside and the bees will sort of get used to her scent. And then as she chews through and gets out into the colony, they're kind of like, okay, we know who this is. It's our new queen. Um, so there's little tricks like that you can do, but there's sometimes no matter what you do, they won't accept a new queen. Um, and a colony without a queen will not survive. Um, how can we help protect wild bees outside of climate protection? Oh, there's so many things that we could do. Um, increasing forage. So there's a number of things that bees are facing right now. One of them is um, urbanization and the loss of, of forage in the environment for them. So making sure that um, you have lots of plants around, um, particularly plants that are known to be good sources of nectar and pollen. Um, you could actually encourage native bees by choosing plants that they would um, traditionally rely upon. If you think about um, how we like to live in our houses with these big grasses, grasses are nice green areas, but from a bee's eyes, they're actually deserts and there's no food in there. So anything you can do to increase um, floral diversity will help to support pollinators. Also, um, reducing or limiting the use of um, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and things like that can have an impact as well. Um, yeah, there's lots of things. And addressing climate change is going to be huge as well. And addressing um, globalization is huge too. And we know that a lot of times we have brought diseases that are affecting our honeybees um, through our trade, not just in honeybee products, but in other products as well. Um, and a lot of the pests and diseases that affect honeybees can affect our native bees as well. And flowers can actually act like dirty doorknobs, where the honeybees are then um, introducing pathogens or pests onto flowers, which act like fomites for the native bees. Um, all right. Um, in the USA, many states have an apiary inspector employed by the State Department of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. What is the role of the veterinarian in diagnosing and treating hive diseases as compared to the state apiary inspector? So, so that's a work in progress too. And that's something that as veterinarians, we really need to figure out how we fit, um, how, how we get to the table and how we, how we stay there and how, how we um, collaborate with the people that are already there. Mm -hmm. You know, veterinarians haven't been involved with honeybees, but it's not like honeybees and beekeepers have just been off on their own with no help. There's and a lot of times really well developed and some of them are really great um, apiary programs where they have inspectors that go out and do hive inspections, which are basically like a clinical examination of a colony. And they will be able to offer diagnoses. They may even sometimes have treatment plans. So veterinarians have to figure out how they can work within the system that's already in place in their state and how we can also offer value to the beekeeper. Mm -hmm. Veterinarians were brought in because we had to provide oversight of antibiotic use and that's huge and that's important but we can't just expect beekeepers to pay us for our signature on a prescription or a VFD. It's an expense to them and they have to get value from that beyond just the antibiotics. So learning how you can um, assess colony health and make recommendations and how you can work with your um, apiary programs is really important. Sure. Um, what determines if an egg will turn into a queen or a worker? Yeah, so that's um, in their larval stage with the amount of food that they're fed. So it was always believed that it's um, royal jelly gets fed to the queen and that's the only thing she gets is royal jelly, whereas the workers in the drones will get royal jelly and then it'll switch to either worker or drone jelly. And it was thought that there is a difference in the food, but it's actually the amount the queen gets a surplus of food and that causes her to develop into the queen. Gotcha. Um, can you speak a little bit about colony collapse disorder from a veterinary's perspective? Yeah, so back in 2006, um, a lot of colonies started to die in the United States and they all had distinct characteristics around the death um, that 
led basically to the coining of the term colony collapse disorder. Fortunately, I don't think we necessarily see it um, often anymore. It seems to have sort of um, fallen by the wayside, but it's definitely important to understand colony collapse disorder and what bee beekeepers were going through. Even though we don't necessarily have colony collapse disorder um, per se, like with the very distinct um, symptoms in the colony, we still have really high colony mortality and winter losses. So in the United States every year, there's a group called the beekeeping, um, sorry, the Bee Informed Partnership, and they collect data every year from beekeepers on what colonies survived through the year and um, particularly what colonies died over the winter. And it's close to 50% of the colonies that are dying every now, um, right now every winter. It's an unsustainable loss for beekeepers because if you can think about, like you do become emotionally attached to your bees. Um, you don't want to see 50% of them dying every year, but also if you have to replace them, which we can do because they're agricultural, um, we breed them, we can replace those losses, but it's expensive to have to replace those losses. So it's really important not just to understand colony collapse disorder, but to understand that we have this really high unsustainable um, winter losses every single year. Yeah, that's really interesting because I know that that's something that keeps getting brought up. So I'm glad that that was asked. Um, there is a myriad of commercial and homemade treatments against Varroa. Which one do you think um, have been tested most rigorously or proven to be effective? Are any of them better than propagating Varroa sensitive uh, hygiene behavior? Okay, so for Varroa, I would say there is no one product that is suitable. You cannot rely on one single product. The approach to Varroa really has to be an integrated pest management approach where you're monitoring for Varroa every year and then you do different techniques. So sometimes things like um, interrupting the brood cycle can reduce because the Varroa reproduces in brood. Um, so interrupting brood can cause a break in the amount of Varroa and can reduce it. Um, things like trying to encourage drones to be produced by using different um, foundation because the drones take longer to develop, more varroa can be produced inside of the drones. So you can have them produce a bunch of drone larvae and then you can discard it or destroy it. Um, and that will get rid of lots of varroa. And then there's um, sort of soft chemical applications, things like formic acid or oxalic acid, sort of these organic chemicals that can be used and are really useful. And then there's sort of the harder chemicals. So um, things that are more like pesticides mm -hmm. can be used as well. You have to use a variety of these techniques and you can't just say every single year, I'm going to use this one thing and think that you will be successful at managing Varroa. Varroa has been around since the 80s and it's still the number one killer of honeybees. So we still are not dealing with it as well as we need to. So it's an integrative approach and it's going to change year after year to year and it's going to change depending on what's going inside, going on inside of your colony. Gotcha. And I think this is our last question. Um, I heard that recently there has been an introduction of Asian giant hornets to North America. Yeah. Uh, these are predators of honeybees. Have you seen this as a growing issue? Well, it's certainly a majorly growing issue in the media. Um, <laughs> thankfully, they're calling them murder hornets and scaring the daylights out of everybody. Um, they're actually a really cool insect. Um, so they, so they're um, a type of, of hornet or wasp. And hornets and wasps, um, they do have um, carbohydrate sources like nectar, um, which is where they get their energy. But their protein, different from bees, they get their protein from either eating um, other insects or carry on. And so the Asian giant hornet really likes to prey on honeybee colonies and they actually will take the thoraxes of the bees um, and they will take those little, and they'll make a meatball out of it because they have all that flight muscle in there and they'll take that back and feed it to their young. Um, and they will actually, if they choose a certain colony that they want to um, overtake that colony, they can kill all of the bees in that colony in a matter of hours. They will just um, decapitate them. They have really big mandibles for biting and uh, they will bite the bees to death and they can destroy an entire colony. So it is a concern. Um, the Asian giant hornets are native sort of to the more temperate um, and subtropical parts of Asia. 
And the climate there is not unlike our climate in the Pacific Northwest. And also the Asian giant hornet, um, they don't go to flowers for their carbohydrate source. They actually um, use tree sap. And we have a lot of similar tree species to what's in their native range. So there is definitely a concern that they will become established here if they're not already. We don't yet know though what that's going to mean and how much, how far they will be able to distribute themselves. So where I am in Ontario um, versus where the Asian giant hornets are in British Columbia, we have our prairie provinces, which if any of you have visited in the wintertime, get extremely cold. And I am not sure that those um, hornets will be able to survive such cold temperatures, but we don't yet know. So we have to just sort of see. There is a lot going on though between on, on both the Canadian and the American side and on the provincial level as well as on the national level. Um, there's a lot of work being done to locate the hornets, to trap them and to destroy all of the queens. Um, so I'm still hopeful that they will be eradicated, but I think we need to prepare and I think there are preparations occurring in case they do um, become established. Yeah, they've definitely been in the media. So I'm glad that we had that question. That was, um... <laughs> Yeah, I, I would not want to meet one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it looks like um, we are running a little low on time. So, Dr. Kyle, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom and your knowledge. And um, we really appreciate you taking the time to educate us. You are welcome. It was lots of fun. And hopefully you guys are encouraged to sort of look more into to incorporating honeybees into your future practices. So Absolutely. thanks so much, guys. Thank you.